So this morning, uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be here. And if most people know me about my health, I'm a very private person. Uh, to put this in perspective, when I talk about how private I am, uh, I was at a pastor's wives retreat, and this is going back about three or four years ago. I could barely breathe, but my blood pressure and everything was fine. Everything looked to be good. And, but uh, Carolyn the night before says, once you relieve me the numbers in case when you die, I know who to call. And, and I go, okay, so maybe, maybe I should get a checkup or get seen, but I'm at this pastor's wives retreat, so I go, I'm having a hard time breathing, and uh, when I'd walk, I couldn't talk and walk at the same time. So at that point, I go, yeah, probably I should go see a doctor, but I said, you know, they have praise and worship in the morning. And, you know, they have the breakfast, and, and we'll see everybody. So I decided that, hey, I'm just going to go, we'll, and then we'll go after that, and I'll go see a doctor. So we go to this praise and worship time. I can't sing. And we're standing there, and we're, we're listening, singing, and eating. And then I tell everybody, I said, hey, look, I'm, I've got to go to the clinic real quick. I'll, I'll be back, though, for the next lunch session. So I go to the, I was going to go to a clinic, and Carolyn goes, no way, you're going right to the hospital. So we go into the emergency room, and they do a quick triage on me, and then they take me right back. And then they order the sonogram, they order all these things, and then the doctor comes in and he looks at me and he backs up and he looks at the room. He looks at me and he looks at the room, the room, and he says, are you Mr. Sawyer? And I said, yes. He goes, I didn't expect you to be conscious. And he says, I have a team coming in here. So let me call that off so it doesn't scare you. I've got a team coming in, and I think I'll do something different since you're conscious. And what had happened is, a couple of weeks before, I had flown, and there was a lot of issues, and it took me from Yuma to Washington, D.C. It took me over 40 hours to get there. And I sat in the plane multiple hours on the tarmac where you couldn't move, and, and I got a blood clot, a deep vein thrombosis or something like they call it, but it started throwing clots and my lungs were filling up to where I could, it was almost about to cover my arteries and I would have been dead. He said that I had a couple of hours before you would have had serious issues. And then not too long after that, you would probably just die. Now I, I think about that and I, I think about how I treated it at the very beginning and I, I rerun the morning, right? I'm there breakfast with all these pastors and pastors' wives. Hey, I'll be right back, right? I'm okay. I'm just going to get checked out, and I'll be right back. But in essence, I was close to death, and I didn't even know it. I had a, what do you call it? I can't, names escape me, the, but the pulmonary doctor, she came and she says, uh, so why did you wait so long anyway? This is a couple of days afterwards. And I said, well, you know, my blood pressure was good. Everything was really great. And she just looked at me. She goes, could you breathe? I'm like, well, you know, maybe not very well. And she says, you know, next time when you can't breathe, that's a good time to go to the emergency room. <laughs> But I will say this is a lot of times we don't know what's going on with us. And there's things even in our spiritual life that may come up. And it's like this. And, and I know a lot of people, I was supposed to have a surgery, whether I've been here or not. Uh, I don't know. Uh, depending on recovery. But they found something. They found that my blood sugar was too high. 
which I was a diabetic and they didn't know what to do with it and they said you got to go get checked out I did not know it and so it was revealed to me and a lot of times when we look at scriptures and even as we study this morning the passage of scripture there's things in our lives that we may not even know that could actually hurt us and when we get to scripture we start to understand uh, what happens and this is all good news you know a lot of times you'll hear pastors that just you know it's like okay we got to get people to come to the altar we got to make them feel bad guilty whatever that's not my job because all there is is good news here is there a time when we see the good news and we go I want to I want that in my life and the answer is yes we, we looked last week at part one of this about God insanely loves us. And we sing some really, really good songs today uh, about uh, the Father, uh, the good, good Father. Uh, you know, that He loves us so much. It's, it's unexplainable. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, if you would like to turn before we get into last week's, uh, one of the things I want to talk about is Romans 5, 3 through 5. And it's just about love. And a lot of times love is a feeling or how do we get this love of God in us. We talked, uh, it'll, it's on YouTube, I'll send out a link. Uh, if you're not on our email, if you haven't got our email recently from us, uh, I would fill out a connection card and give it to me. And, but we're on YouTube and you can actually get this message from last week. But we talked about God's love for us, and we'll see why He loves us so much in just a second as we reviewed last week. But Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, not only that, and again, on your own, I would read Romans 1 through 7, this whole passage, but 3 through 5, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God loves us. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who He has given us. Now, if you can think of a glass, and it's empty, and you have this substance, and you pour it in, is the glass doing anything? The glass is there, it's, it's, a, it's a receptacle, and whatever is being poured in is filling it. And when you look at this verse, I get excited because when we talk about the role of the Holy Spirit, this is that the Holy Spirit's role is to fill us with God's love. And so when we talk about, you know, love, usually it's a, it's a reciprocal thing. But if you read that passage, uh, Romans 5, you'll see that God loved us first. That He, while we were, we were not good people, and, and, and even in those verses it says, it's hard to get somebody to die for a really good person. Let alone us. And what happens here is that God loves us so much that He sent His Son to die for us. And he came from heaven, came to earth, he died, and because of his death, not only did he die, but he rose again, because of that, we have a right relationship with God. We can have peace with God. And a lot of times we, we think about that as in Christianity and church, we just get so used to saying it, oh, we can have peace with God. But in this chapter, it kind of mentions it. If you ever read Revelation like 5 through 9, you'll get a bit more of it. Is that there's a wrath of God, right? A lot of times we don't talk about that because it's through God's kindness that leads to salvation. But we, if we don't know Jesus Christ, if we are not peace with God, then there is a wrath that comes down on us. Uh, and, and again, we're separated from God. There's a wrath that comes from us. And so, at that point, when we accept Jesus, or we have Jesus, 
It says it appeases that. It puts like an ointment on that. And we have peace with God. Now, a lot of times when I mention this, because a lot of times people don't understand that we were lost and that there is a penalty. One of the illustrations I, I like to use is, is there was a gentleman, you know, we, we talk about being saved or being born again or things like that. And it's like, why? And the world looks at us and go, why would you want to be saved? Why do we want to be, quote, born again? Why do we want all this? And it's like this. There's a school for the deaf and blind. And it has a speed limit of 15 miles an hour. And you're in your Ferrari. Or maybe a Toyota. But you're going 55 miles an hour. You don't even see the sign. And all of a sudden you go through that school zone. You're going 55 miles an hour through a death blind school, which is pretty bad. You go through and you get clocked. And the officer pulls you over and you have no clue what's going on. And the first response is, I didn't do anything wrong, the speed limit was 55 and until you came down to the school zone. And then the officer says, hey, do you know why I pulled you over? And a lot of times we don't know why we're separated from God. People don't understand that they're separated from God. And he says, hey, you were speeding. You were in a school zone. That's reckless driving. And I'm taking you to jail. And by the way, this is a, a, a school for the deaf and blind. And by the way, the judge is not going to be happy. Right? So all of a sudden you think that you're okay. And all of a sudden you, you go, what do I do now? You, you, now you understand that you've done something wrong. And I think a lot of times when we talk about God's love, we don't really fully understand God's wrath in what Jesus Christ did with us. So God is like, man, I love you so much, I'm sending my son. If you believe in him, then I'm gonna give you peace. You're gonna have, you're gonna be at peace with me. All my wrath, all this wrath that you, you read Revelation, you might even be scared of it. He says, look, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna do that because, to you, because I'm at peace with you. He's not at war with us. We're, we're in a relationship with him. And when you read Romans 5, that whole chapter, and I'd encourage you to do it sometime this week, maybe today when you get home, but it really, it, it goes into that going, God loves us even while we were yet sinners. This is like insane love. This is like, I love you a lot. And because of that, he sent his son. And if we believe in what he, he did for us, then he's at peace with us. And there's all sorts of benefits. And Jesus even says, he's, he goes, look, and, and we've been studying, if you're, if you're visiting or new this, this morning, uh, John 13 through 17 is the passage that we've been talking about, the supernatural life. Because a lot of times we, we don't talk about... Christianity or in the fact that it is supernatural. And this is where we have a supernatural relationship with God. And it should affect the way we live. And here in, in five, it's the good news. I mean, the Bible is just full of good news, right? And here it's just saying, hey, when, when, <clears throat> when you accept this as Jesus Christ, His Spirit in us, floods us with God's love. He fills us. That's one of his roles. So one of the things that we should have is God's love. So we don't always use it, right? Sometimes we give our own love, which is not very good, but we have the opportunity to give God's love. So I just want to put that as just a little bit about the importance of God's love and then in John 16, if you go on to the next point there, 
we covered this last week. This was uh, about Jesus using figures of speech. Right? He was using childbirth. He was using, hey, in a little while. He uses different illustrations. And so in John 16, and I'm not going to read the passage, but John 16, 25 through 28, he speaks figuratively. But then he goes, by the way, a time's coming. It's coming quick that I'm going to do away with all this figurative speaking. And you're going to hear from me directly. You're going to understand things and like you've never understood them before. And he's been talking about the Holy Spirit coming. And then he just said, right before these verses, he says, you can ask in Jesus' name. And he says, but I'm telling you, I might not even ask Jesus. I mean, I may not even ask God. When you pray to God, if you love me, if you believe that I came from God, you might say in Jesus' name, but it may not really matter because God loves you so much that he's going to answer your prayer. And so one of the things that we do, if you haven't seen this amazed, is that we, anything that God does that is amazing, that's beyond what we can do or think, we can, we put that in and a lot of times we'll have a testimony time where we can have that. But it takes us asking. And this is just a question for you, it's not a question to raise your hand on or anything like this, but how many things did you ask for this last week? And this is the interesting thing, because God is saying, I want to show myself strong, so I just want you to ask. I want you to, I really, really want you to ask. I want you to believe in me, and I want you to really ask. Not for like one thing, not for two things, but for lots of things. Why? Because God wants to do amazing things. And I will tell you this, is that if God didn't do amazing things, if God didn't move in my life today, yesterday, then I'm not interested in Christianity. It's a religion. You might as well be something else. But if God is real, he's moving and he's active. Uh, in the back there, and also there's some sheets here. This is kind of a new sheet that was put together on prayer. And uh, you might want to get a copy of that. They're also in the back, uh, hanging up there. But also the fact that Jesus is leaving, he's going to the Father. And so, he's saying, and remember the setting. He was in the upper room. He's being betrayed. He told, he told his disciples, Satan is coming to get me right now. I mean, it, it'd be like, hey, the boogeyman is coming right now. Somebody's coming to get me right now. But Jesus says, Satan has no hold on me. And he says, let's go from here. And remember, he's already, he already heightened things up because he, right before this, he's like, hey, do we have any weapons? You know? Uh, Jesus says this time is going to be not like any other time before. Before he sent them out with nothing, this time he goes, you got any weapons? Now, I haven't heard, I haven't seen the uh, NRA put uh, Jesus asking for weapons on there, but that might be a good, uh, good t-shirt. But he's like, hey, do you have any weapons? And they're like, hey, we got two swords. And he goes, that's good enough. That's all you need. And they leave there. Now, can you imagine this setting? You're going out. Jesus asked you for swords. And he's still talking. He's walking along the way. He's giving you a last illustration. We talked about last week, he's, or the week before, he's talking about childbirth and how, you know, you're going to see joy because they're going to take me away. And you're going, hey, we got swords. Peter has a sword. He, he's always ready to go. And they're, they're walking, and he's telling this story. And he says, man, I've been talking to you in these, like, figurative speeches and everything, parables and everything, but there's going to come a time where I talk to you directly. You're going to understand this. And I'm thinking, he's been with them three years, and he hasn't even talked to them straight. And we pick it up at John 16, 29 through 33. After he says this, his disciple says, ah, oh. now, you know, it's, it's like a, the, the aha moment. They go, ah, oh, you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know 
that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. That means they were questioning him. They were questioning whether or not he was real. And he says, now we know. Now remember, they've been with him for three years. He's about to be betrayed and crucified, beaten and everything else. And he says, now we know. Now we know that we don't need to question you. This is why we believe, and this is why we believe that you came from God. So when you, when you read scriptures, you'll see the disciples were full of questioning because things would happen and they would be like, what's going on? A couple of weeks ago when we had the, uh, the Day of the Children, we had the message of, of Mark 4 where he's in the boat and the wind and the rain, the waves are coming and he's sleeping on a cushion, and he, he wakes up, they wake him up and say, don't you care that we're perishing? And he gets up, he's kind of a little frustrated because they have no faith, and he s rebukes the wind and, and then he calms the sea. And all of a sudden, everybody on the boat is like, they were afraid before, but now they're super afraid because they go, who is this in the boat with us? Remember, the only way they could get to God was through the temple. And through the temple, they could come to the Holy... They, they couldn't even go to the Holy of Holies, but they could come to the priest, and, and that's where God is. In the Old Testament, if they saw God face to face, they would die. And all of a sudden, they're on this boat, and this guy calms the, the, the sea. And now they're really afraid because it's like God on the boat. And then they ask themselves, they go, who is this that can stop the wind and the rain? And so their whole ministry, Jesus was preparing them so that they knew without a shadow of a doubt that he was God. He was flesh, 100% man, he was 100% God. And now, three years, he's about to be crucified, they go, we get it, God. Jesus, we finally get it. You'll be happy. We, we understand. And one of the more important things, not only that he knows everything, which is, which is a, a nice word for omniscient. A lot of times people will use that word omniscient. Uh, but it's just that he knows everything. They believe that he came from God. There was no doubt that Jesus came from God. And they finally got it. And they were proud to tell Jesus, hey Jesus, we got it finally. It took us three years and you're about to die, but we got it. Aren't you proud of us? I could hear them thinking. And then we go to the next verse. Jesus said to them, do you now believe? Those who are taking the leadership class notice how many questions are in here. But he asked them again, do you now believe? Like, do you really believe this? If I had us raise our hands today and said, how many people believe that Jesus knows all things? Most of us would raise our hand. If we said, did Jesus come from God? Most of us would raise our hands. And then Jesus asked them a question, which is interesting. I, I love questions. Do you now believe? Do, do you really believe now? Do, is this what you really believe? And he says, behold, an hour is coming, indeed has come. He says, this is not even going to come, it's coming right now. It's here. Right? So they, they've got to go, in, wow, it's right here. When you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. So, Jesus is like, do you really believe? You believe that I'm, I'm God, and, and I'm Jesus, I'm the Son of God, and all this? I, I tell you, it's going to happen in just a few minutes. You're going to forget everything, and you're going to run for your life, and you're going to go to your home. Now it's interesting, 
Because the disciples just says, hey, we get it. And Jesus says, no, you don't. Not yet, but you will. And I think this is the good news for us because a lot of times we may fail, right? But here's a statement. And uh, this actually comes from uh, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table, also a good song by 10th Avenue North. But you are not your failure. You are not your failure. Meaning we may fail, and most people align ourselves with the failure. And that becomes our identity. A lot of times people get nicknames because of their failures. But Jesus says, you're not your failure. And that's an important aspect to hold on to. You're not, you're, if you have a bad background, maybe things happen to you, that's not who you are. You are different. And Jesus here says, hey, you may not get it. In fact, all y'all are going to, you just said that you understand, believe, but you're going to fail. And there should be some uh, hope in us, knowing that even when we do fail, we're not our failure. You shouldn't see yourself as the failure. You should see you as how God sees you. And as this un unfolds, he says, everyone will leave me alone. Now he's been with not only the 12 disciples, now there's only 11 with him right now, but there was other people that were following him and he's gonna be all alone. Now there's a lot of things you can get personal application from this. One is that one is that people will leave you. They will leave you. And when you think that people have got your back, they don't necessarily have your back. And that's the one thing, if we if we go through life understanding this principle, it makes life a lot different. And a lot of times we, we have expectations that no matter what, people are going to be right there. Even in husband and wife relationships, as much as I want to say, hey, Carolyn, I'm going to be there for everything you need, there's going to be times where I may not. I try not to. I want to be there. They wanted to be there for Jesus. Jesus just said, and if you're dependent on other people, this is what happens. I mean, Jesus, they knew that he was, knew everything and that he came from God, and yet, probably within an hour or two, they're all going to leave him. And Jesus makes a very important statement here for us to live by, and he says, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. He says, the Father's never going to leave you. I kind of put it down in the notes with Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. And it's interesting, those verses talk about, uh, I will never leave you, and the Lord is my helper. And those two things we teach at CEF, we, we kind of do it like this. Uh, I will never leave me. I will never leave Tom. The Lord is Tom's helper. And, or you can do it the fifth. I will never leave Tom. The Lord is my shepherd. And it makes us strong, right? So, real quick. Put out a hand. I will never leave. And put your name in there. Right? I will never leave the Lord is my helper. And if you remember that, those are times where you go, I don't know what to do. And you may feel abandoned. You may feel like you're all alone. And God says, hey, by the way, Jesus, Jesus himself knew that was the outcome. He's like, everybody's going to leave. Now think about that. You spent three years with ministry building these people up, right? And when it comes down to it, they're all going to leave you. 
But Jesus knew that. He said, I'm not alone. Don't worry about me, I'm not alone. Right? So, the situation now, uh, when we look at this, is he's predicted that they leave. Jesus says he's never alone. And then he gives us a key. A key about his love and a key about living. And he says, I have said these things. This is verse 33. He said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, how many people want peace today? Right? I mean, that's the number one thing. People just like relationships or just everything going on. It's like, why can't we just have peace? Right? When, uh, and I didn't get into this, but I was supposed to have surgery, got kind of scrubbed, delayed. And it was interesting because the next day I, I went to the doctor, and, but after that I didn't have anything scheduled, right? And it was just like, what do we do now? You know, we did manage to fill it up, <laughs> but it was interesting. But everybody wants peace. There's, there's families that want peace because there's so much turmoil. A lot of times the turmoil is about religion. It's about Christianity. There are more people hurt by the church than should be, right? And Jesus says, I have said these things to you. Now, if you read this, he's telling us, I've said these things to you. These are things that Jesus Christ himself wanted you to hear. There's only about 84 days of Christ's life in the scripture. And so it's really limited of what's actually in the scripture. And actually John says later on, he says, if we wrote down everything that Jesus did, it would be so much. I mean, Jesus was healing people left and right. There's times where it says power was just coming out from him. And there was just so many things. But out of the 84 days, this is, Jesus says, I'm telling you these things so that you may have peace in me. Now, we, we can have peace in, in Jesus, and this is the reality of it. Most of the time we look at this as just religious talk, right? Tom, you talk about peace. What does that peace look like? When you can have peace in the midst of a lot of these situations, it's unnatural. It's supernatural. And a lot of times people say, oh, man, you know, What's happening, you know? And, and I just go, well, I have peace about it. Because you can't have peace in the midst of everything going on. And peace is really what God does. And, and you go, how does this work? It's like, well, he just told you God loves you so much that he's pouring his love in you. And when you have God's love in you and you're, and you, you're focused in on Jesus... And you love Jesus. We talked about that last week. And like I said, if you missed it, you can look at it. But if you love Jesus and believe that he came from God, then he's in control of all things. And when we're in Jesus, we have this peace. I don't know about you, but take a second. Here's a question. How much peace did you have this last week? And, and hopefully, this is not a trick question, but sometimes even as Christians, we don't, we don't want to say, well, I, I have peace, but I don't want to say anything because then people might think I'm prideful or they've got, the, you know. But man, Jesus wants you to have peace. And we should come on Sunday morning, we should just say, man, we had a lot of peace this week. Because we live this way. And don't you want to live this way? And when the world sees that we have peace unlike anybody else, they're like, what are you taking? What are you on? It's like when I started losing weight, somebody, they said, how did you lose the weight? And I said, obedience to God, right? When I started listening to what God told me, I started losing the weight. And so God's in us. He wants us to have the peace. If you, if you walk away today, one of the things you need to know is that that. God came that I might that you may have life 
And part of that life is to have peace. And if you don't have peace, it's something that he wants to give to you. It's really good news. In Jesus, we have peace. In the world, we have tribulation. We have distress. We have sufferings. Anybody, we can raise our hand on this. Anybody have tribulations? Right? I like the two-handed. Yeah. Is, is life easy? No. And a lot of times we just go, well, I'm a Christian, so I really shouldn't have this. Jesus says, hey, by the way, um, it's full of tribulations. It's full of distresses. It's full of this stuff. I find it interesting. Some Christians would be like, man, I'm suffering. Like, did you read scripture? <laughs> That's a good thing. And you go, what? Yeah, it's a good thing. But no, I'm suffering. You need to, no, we need to change our thought process. We need to change what we believe. And I'm not saying that we go through grief, and it says when somebody goes through grief, you grieve with them, right? So I'm not saying that, that you come to church and everything, and you just smile when you're not, because we need each other. But what I'm saying is that the world is going to come at us. The world is not the way God set it up. Sin entered in. So we have things like cancer. We have things that we don't understand. We have people that are addicted. We have people that die unexpectedly. We have sin and that's coming in. And we just go, God, I don't understand. And God says, trust me. I'm going to give you peace. I've experienced that peace, and that peace goes beyond our understanding, anything we can think of. But in Jesus, we have peace. In the world, we're going to have tribulation. So when you look at the world, there's some good things that will happen because we follow Jesus. But in general, in this world, we're going to have tribulation. And Jesus just said, that's the way it is. Now, I just, I don't want to get carried away with this. But Romans 5, 3 through 5 that we said, listen to this. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. How many people need hope? If you could sell it in a bottle, people would go, hey, I need hope. And this is what this whole passage is about. It's like, hey, there's going to things happen to you. I'm going to give you peace. You're going to go through it. And you're going to build character. You know, a lot of times I go, don't, isn't my character good enough? And nobody's called me Jesus Christ lately. So I know there's a, a, a distance between us, right? So God is working on me. And I say that every week because every week that I, I, I speak, God has already been dealing with me, saying, hey, you need to change this, or you need to do this. And he's making me better, and it's giving me character, and because my character's changing, I have hope. I have hope that this, he's going to keep on doing this, and life is going to keep on getting better. Is my suffering going to go away? The answer is no, as long as we're here on earth. In fact, the biggest thing that, that will happen to us is we will die. Ten out of ten of us are going to die. Not very good odds. If it said a hundred percent chance of rain, it's probably going to rain. We have a hundred percent, and that is when we look at it. Death is like the ultimate. It's like I'm going to smack you down, and you're done. Jesus Christ came that we may have life, so He could break death's chains. The biggest thing that Satan had was death. And that's why he wanted to kill Jesus. Because if he kills Jesus, he's out of the way. He didn't plan on Jesus coming back to life. And when Jesus came back to life, I think it's 1 Corinthians 2. It says that if Satan would have known that Jesus Christ was going to come back to life, he would have never killed him in the first place. He's like, did not plan on this. Did not think that this would happen. Why? Because he conquered death. 
the main thing that is going to take us away, he conquered. And he says, because I've done that, I've conquered the max. I've got an engineering background. And in calculus, you, you do the minimum and the max, and the max is uh, the upper limit. And, and, and Jesus says, I broke the max. There's nothing less that can hold me. I have power over everything. I've defeated the max thing that Satan could do. In the upper room, he says, Satan's coming at me. He, he doesn't have anything on me, but this is it. And so, in the world we have tribulation, Jesus says, I've overcome the world. And that's a good news to hold on to. Jesus has overcome the world. And how, why that's important is, when we have Jesus, we don't start from zero. And if you, if you listen to the uh, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table, that series, that's one of the things he emphasizes that, is that we don't start from zero, we start with Jesus Christ. You know, a lot of times, like next door, they, they had this old house. And when the developer came in, they didn't come in to go, hey, we're going to take this old house that has a lot of issues, and we're going to try to rebuild it. We're going to try to make it worth something or look like something. No, the builder came in and go, this is worthless. I'm going to scrap it and it'll be brand new. It was actually cheaper for them to do that. In fact, they put two new houses on that land and they doubled the running. And it's brand new houses. We have a house to the right of us or the left of us, depending on your perspective. Same thing. This house has been there a long time. And if you were to try to actually fix that house, they could not. They came in and bulldozed it over. They cleared the lot. And they're going to build a brand new house. And that's the way God is with us, is that He makes us new. And, and in this, we start with Jesus Christ, who's overcome the world, and if we hang with him, if we focus on him, and remember, he's like, I'm your friend because I'm going to die for you. You love him, know that he came from God, God's going to answer your prayers. So when you're going through these things, you can start praying and see God answer, and God wants to answer. So many times in the Christian realm, we go, well, I don't know about the supernatural stuff because... You know, if I ask and he doesn't answer, or we do a cop-out, and we say, well, God's answer says no or wait. But I tell you that God wants to say yes. He really does want to say yes. So when, we, when we're following him, and we go, hey, God, this is what I need, he says, ask me. He says, ask my Father and ask in my name. And I, I give this illustration to you. I've given a couple of times, but, you know, my, my parents live in, in Virginia. And if a couple came to their house, knocked on the door, and said, hey, can you put us up for the night? My parents would probably say no. If this couple called me, and I called my, my dad, and I said, hey, dad, I got this couple I know. And they're in Virginia. They don't have a place to stay. Can they stay with you tonight? When they knock on that door, the answer is going to be yes. And by the way, I know my mom. There's a meal waiting for her. Right? She's already put clean, clean sheets on. And she's and they're welcome them in. And the difference is because they've asked in my name. They know me. And I'm asking my father if he'll let them in. And he says yes. And it's the same way with us. When we, when we love Jesus, we, we go to God and we say, Hey God, I, I, this is a real need. I'm, I'm following Jesus. And I know he's from you. I know he's at the right hand. Uh, sitting right there and I'm asking in his name for this. 
And he's saying, all right. But even if we look at this thing, God loves us so much that Jesus may go, I may not even have to ask. He may just know. And he's just going to do it anyway. And I don't have to intercede. And a lot of times when we think about praying to God or Jesus or whatever we want to do, we don't think about this. But imagine what heaven looks like. We, we've got God sitting there. He's listening to the prayers. And Jesus is right there. And he goes, oh yeah. Fonzie's saying that. You know? And he goes, Jesus is like, should I intercede for Fonzie? Yes. <laughs> Kim says yes. <laughs> so, but you might as well get it covered, right? Hey, in Jesus' name, hey, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, hey, I want you to intercede for me to God. And Jesus goes, okay, I'm going to come before the throne, and I'm going to say, hey, uh, Fonzie's down there, and he's got this prayer request, and I think we really should do it. I mean, do you think about that conversation happening? Because it's actually talking literally that that's what he does. And Jesus says, by the way, if you love me, if you just love me, I might get to say, hey, God. And he's like, Jesus, i got to handle him. I heard Fonzie. I love him so much. I'm just going to do it. And the reason why he does it is to glorify his son. And the son wants to do it because it glorifies God. And we, when we get a hold of that, and even in the, even in the she, it's like, how will your answered prayer glorify God? And when you think through that, and you go, is there a scripture behind it? That's why I like those sheets. It, it kind of puts it all together. And so when we think about this passage, uh, there's just some amazing things happen. And, and I didn't get into Galatians 2.20. Does anybody know that off the top of their head? Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. So what that is saying is it's like, I'm not going to live. I'm going to let Christ live in me. And that's how we should live. We should let Christ live in us. So if I look at two of the takeaways for today, one is that Jesus knows everything. He's omniscient. It's kind of a big word. I don't know if it'll get you a cup of coffee or not. You say it a couple of times. But... Uh, we, we can say it together, I guess. Omniscient. Omniscient. One more time. Omniscient. Just in case you hear somebody say it. But it means omniscient knows everything. God knows everything. Jesus knows everything. Even in this past passage, he would say, I know they're talking about it, and so I'm going to answer them. And all the time through Scripture, you'll see Jesus saying, I, I read their hearts. Uh, and so you'll know that, that he's all-knowing. And the other thing is that Jesus came from God. That was one of the most important things in this passage. And it's interesting when you know these things, because if this is the main thing that John is trying to get across, that Jesus came from God, then you should be able to go to John 1 and start, and that should be his whole thing. And that's a theme in John. If you read John this week, uh, you would see that, that John emphasized that Jesus came from God. Even the story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus, that's where we get the phrase born again. Nicodemus came to him at night. He's a teacher, a Jewish teacher. He's a ruler. He's part of the Sanhedrin. And, and he goes, we know that you came from God because nobody can do what you're doing. Right away, John emphasizes that he came from God. And you'll see that through the, all of John, actually, all the scripture. God will never leave us. You know, you may think you're going through a hard time right now. And people may desert you. Friends may desert you. Uh, your pastor may desert you. I do like desserts, but they're kind of desert you. But they'll desert you. You will feel maybe lonely. There's churches that 
may have hurt you, and you might feel lonely or on your own, and you may feel distance from God, and Jesus and, and God says, although everybody leaves you, I'm right here. And if you know Jesus, it says his spirit is fill us with his love. And we should have his love. The other one is we will not always act on our belief. The sad thing is, your pastor may not act on his belief. I told you the last couple of weeks, I don't think of myself as a person who would fear. And when there's a couple of things that came up, and I would just say I was concerned about it, but God asked me the question, why do you fear? Do you have any faith? And so I had to go, I don't really fear. This is just an issue. And God says, no. Why do you fear? Have you no faith? And so I recognize that I go, you know, that's probably a fear. I'm not sure if I'm going to tell anybody that. Right? But God says, oh, so you got a pride problem too, right? Okay. So, so, so it's like, okay. So I'll get both of them out of the way. So, but he will never leave us. And, and sometimes we won't do the right thing. That does not mean that God goes, oh man, Fonzie is such a bad person. He had this prayer request, but now, you know, I don't know. But think about this. He's, he's got his disciples. He's got his disciples. And he goes, by the way, you're all going to leave me. You're all going to run away. But yet, he's given them hope. And, and he says, there's going to be a time where you, you, you're not going to believe, but I've overcome the world. I've overcome everything. I've overcome death. He's about to overcome death. He says, I've overcome everything. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But take heart. Take this to heart. If there's anything you take to heart, you're going to have some bad times in this world, but take this to heart that I've overcome it so that you can just press on. And that's what God gives us. He gives us life. And a lot of times, this is not a pious Christian, re, you know, religious thing. This is what actually happens. A lot of times in Christianity and in churches, we don't experience the reality of Jesus Christ. And I always tell people, like, when we talk about amazed, if you haven't had anything amazed over the last couple of weeks, you may want to think about how real your relationship is. If you haven't had anything amazed over the last month, you may want to think about how real. And I'm not saying that you don't, you aren't a Christian or anything. It's like last week we talked about have you left your first love? When I was dating Carolyn uh, back in the day, right? Time and money, this is almost embarrassing, but I'd have. Not embarrassing, it's just, I spent, when we started dating, I was spending $400 a month just going out. Okay? Now, we've been married 36 years, and we dated, go back, so let's say 40 years ago. 40 years ago, $400 a month. How much was that? It's, it's probably close to about $1,000 now. Man, we went to some of the nicest places. We, we did all sorts of stuff. My dad was like, Tom, you're crazy. He says, you could go to wherever and put that money away. I'm like, man, I love her. We just had a bit of time together. And, and I wouldn't think anything about it. Why? Because I just, I just loved her. And, and Jesus is saying the same thing like last week. He says, you just need to love me. And when you love me, you're going to do all these things for me. And you're not going to really care. And just as another illustration, I decided to go to school. And I had no money. And we spent $40 a month. <laughs> 
and we get together and see what coupons we had for like Burger King. We go, okay, I got ten dollars. Where are we gonna go, right? Because whether we had a lot of money or a little money, we're content. What makes us content? It's the love. And Jesus says the same thing. It's the love that makes us content. We won't always act on our own what we believe, but we should. In Jesus, we have peace. The world's going to be hard. But Jesus has overcome the world. And that last bullet there. We can have peace and overcome the world. This is all good news today. Right? It should be good news every Sunday. Because all I'm trying to do is saying that Jesus is, if you're living without peace, that's not the way he wants you to. If you're going through struggles, expect them. But know that Jesus has overcome everything and he'll lead you through. Psalms 23, some people like it, some people don't because it says, even though I walk through the shadow of death, and there's times that we are going to walk through the shadow of death. So. But this is good news. If you don't know Jesus and you would like to today, today's a really good day to do that. If you go, I don't know what to do next. Um, just let me know and say, hey, Tom, I, I wouldn't mind somebody coming alongside me and just teaching me. These are things, and they're, they're common questions is, that you ask yourself is, do I really love Jesus? And how do you fall in love with Jesus? And part of it is seeing who he is. And making him a part of it. We're going to just pray. We'll have a we're going to sing that song again of come to the altar. And as we as we sing, as we think about where your life is and think about what you want it to have. Because when you walk out of here, it is what it is. And it's decisions that you have to make. And, uh, but know this, that God loves you insanely, that he sent his son for you, and he wants you to have a life of peace, and he wants you to have a life where uh, you overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. Father, I thank you for all you do for us. And even now as we come to you, we, we realize the, the reality of actually asking you, talking to you, Father, if there is anybody who doesn't have that today and wants to, I pray that today would be the day. Father, if somebody just says, you know, maybe there's something I need to give up. I know for me in my life, it seems like this last year, every week you've shown me where you want me to go deeper. And maybe today there's somebody here, Father, that your spirit is just nudging and saying, hey, you, you need to, to give it up or, or to, to just... Just seek me more. Father, whatever it is, I put it in your hands. I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word that you communicated to us. And Father, I ask these things in your son's name.